Good day and welcome, Thomas Jefferson Hour podcast listeners. And as always, thank you for listening. It's great to have you all. We so appreciate you, your questions, your letters, your criticisms, your whatever you send us, is including the splendid gifts you send to me, by the way. But <laughs> we love it all. And this week, I, I named this topic. I love this topic. Yep. Jefferson's dinner parties. Yeah, it, it was great fun. It always is fun. And and again, there's that 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 quote, Jefferson to William Hamilton, April 22nd, 1800. This should be on coffee cups or bumper stickers. I never considered a difference of opinion in politics, in religion, in philosophy as cause for withdrawing from a friend. And his daughter Martha said with a little bit more snark, my father never gave up a friend or an opinion. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to think about that. That's what good, does she mean? I, don't know. I guess she thought he had a little stubborn streak, which he did. Uh huh. But his dinner parties, we didn't talk about one, which is equally important and, and in some ways um, could have caused an international oh, incident. Oh, the Lafayette. He's in, he's in France in 1789. Lafayette um, is part of the, the moderate faction in the French Revolution before things went really wrong. And he came to Jefferson and, again, all upset the way Hamilton had been. And he said, would you please have a dinner party at your salon? And I'd like to bring eight people. It's off the record. In a sense, we're going to deny that it ever happened. But after the – I'm sure you'll serve a great meal. The meal, by the way, was, was, was made by James Hemings, the slave from Monticello. After the meal – I'd like to have a roundtable discussion about where we should head with the new French constitution and what sort of a, a French republic we should create. And Jefferson was very uneasy about this. He said, all right, I'll do it, but I'm not going to – I'm only going to be the host. So, of course, he puts on this great meal. Lafayette brings these people. They have a long, I think, four, five or six-hour conversation. Jefferson was so worried about this that it's a breach of diplomatic protocol because he, after all, is hosting a revolutionary – cadre, that the next day he went to the French foreign minister and confessed and said, I just want you to know I did this. Maybe I shouldn't have done it. Um, I felt like I owed it to Lafayette, who's been so good to me and so on. And the French foreign minister said, hey, I knew all about it. There are spies everywhere. And so Jefferson, before he even confessed that he had had this dinner party, had been outed. And the French foreign minister said, I'm glad you did it. It's exactly the right thing. You know, you're trustworthy. This is the kind of sober, responsible conversation that we need to be having. What what year was this? 1789. Huh. Just before Jefferson – August 1789, just before Jefferson came back. And, of course, as soon as Jefferson got back to the U.S., the French Revolution, the French Revolution uh, spun out of control and devolved into the reign of terror. It's a good thing he came back when he did. He wanted to go back to France, he says. He wanted to see the revolution through. You know, he spent a lot of the rest of his life trying to figure out what went wrong because he was an optimist. He's sort of the Pollyanna of American history. And he kept saying, this is going to end well. It's going to be a, a good republic, maybe a constitutional monarchy, start modestly. In a generation or two, you can go farther. And then when it all blew up into just insanity, the reign of terror, the guillotine, the street riots, mob action of every sort – Aristocrats being taken out of carriages and literally torn limb from limb by angry mobs, including some of Jefferson's friends, he he refused to he refused to admit that he had been wrong. And it wasn't until the later conversation with Jefferson and John Adams after they had been brought back into friendship that Jefferson finally said, well, "It must have killed him to say." He said, "You know what, Mr. Adams, you were right." And I was wrong. I thought the whole thing was going to turn into something benign. It was worse than you predicted. It was worse than anyone could have predicted. And I, I, was, I was flatly wrong about it. Jefferson doesn't do that. But he did it in candor to John Adams. And that mm. dinner party is sort of one of the pivotal dinner parties yeah, of his we life. We need to revisit those letters again soon. They're so good. Uh, meanwhile, uh, I, I want to take a moment just to thank all of you that have been writing the show. I'm sure we'll do another... Uh, question and answer show soon, um, but we every piece of mail that comes in gets read, and there's a lot of them. And if you want to come to France, if you want to come to the Jefferson and France trip to, uh, October 20th through 29, there are a handful of places left. I'm so excited about this, David. We're going to have a Jefferson dinner of some sort? Absolutely. We're Great. going to several places, that, including the the 
the restaurant Mécanique, where he learned the dumbwaiter. So in the in this restaurant, which still exists in a form in Paris, I've been to it, he first saw the dumbwaiter. So they made the food downstairs in the kitchen. And then there's a food elevator, a dumbwaiter that lifted it up. And he incorporated and that. And then he's like, I'm doing that at Monticello. Well, it, it was so that <laughs> yeah. you keep things private. And private and keep and, and, and serve the food faster. And so at Monticello, he not only had a wine dumbwaiter, which brought up bottles of wine from the cellarage, but he had he didn't have food elevators, but he had a lazy Susan door in the dining room. And then they would spin the door and he also had these like lazy Susan that would you could wheel up and then you would open up a little door and there would be hot food in and then he would say to someone at the table Mrs. Madison would you be willing to serve tonight and then she'd open them up and and hand out all the food Jefferson talk about eccentric this is Jefferson the eccentric he just loved this sort of thing he loved gimcracks and whimsicalities and Little things he learned in France. So he was a gadget you, guy. If you're interested in coming on the Thomas Jefferson tour of France, I'll be there the whole time. I can't wait. O- October 20th through 29th. Now would be the time to go to jeffersonhour.com to sign up. And believe me, this is going to be a magnificent trip. And while you're there, um, just a reminder that we we do you and I do this show for the for love nothing. of it. We do yes, and for uh, pate. We're not asking for money for ourselves. We're asking for, for money to grow the show. And if you are of a mind to support it, um, you can do so by clicking on make a donation or by joining the seventeen seventy six club. And if neither of those work for you, you can just write us a letter. We get some of the nicest mail from people. We do, and we get criticism, and we like that too. And we listen to all of it, and we appreciate it. And with that, sir, let's go to. And the if show. you want to send like a Toyota pickup, you know, I'll use it in the just, garden. Just stop that. No, I'd love that. Okay. Yeah, but listen to the show. This is Jefferson and his dinner parties at the White House. Thanks for listening. Good day, citizens, and welcome to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. Mr. Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay Jenkinson. I'm your host, David Swenson, and seated across from me is President Thomas Jefferson. Good to see you, sir. Good day to you, citizen. Mr. Jefferson, I, I have a... A pleasant subject, I hope you think it's pleasant, for discussion this week, and that is the subject of you and your dinner party, sir. Well, indeed, I believe that breaking bread together is one of the most harmonious and socially constructive things that we can possibly do, and I prided myself both at Monticello and in Washington, D.C., or wherever else I happened to be, in hosting dinner parties that were agreeable to everyone, whether they shared my political principles or not. Well, I know, sir, that it was your desire to keep your your public and your private lives separate, fair to say? Oh, very much so. But but these dinners that you held, particularly at the president's house, show what a gift you had for for using dinners to attain political ends. Well, at the time, the new capital in Washington in the District of Columbia um, was really weak on restaurants and Uh, wine bars and bookstores and many other things. Uh, Governor Morris, the the arch-federalist, said, I see it as a splendid city for future habitation. And so the people that were in Congress, senators and and representatives and people in the cabinet and others who had business in the the federal capital were often um, pretty disappointed with the food that was available uh, in the federal city. So as president... I realized that this was opportunity for me, that I could I could serve the best meals in the District of Columbia and maybe invite eight or 10 or even 12 people, three or four afternoons per week to the White House, and I would give them the kind of food that, well, better really than that they might expect in Philadelphia, and that this would serve a purpose. This would, would cut the the tedium of living in the new federal capital and reconcile them to the fact that we had created a new capital uh, from the from the wilderness up. But it also, I knew, would make people more likely to listen uh, generously to my proposals that, that hospitality and generosity uh, are ways of lubricating um, social harmony and political harmony. And that although we never talked about politics at my dinner parties, I was strict about that. Um, it was clear that when people came and enjoyed them, 
that it put them in a more conciliatory mood than they might have been had they been uh, eating tavern food somewhere. Well, again, uh, I go back to this. It is said what a gift you had for using these dinners to attain political ends, whether you spoke about them at the dinners or not. But I came across a statement of yours, sir. Uh, It was in a letter to William Hamilton in April of 1800. Sir, I, I would I would like your permission to post this many, many places if I could. Oh, it would be it would be so helpful during our times. You wrote, I never considered a difference of opinion in politics, in religion, in philosophy as cause for withdrawing from a friend. Of course. And you know, my motto is almost this. Uh, we may disagree, but let us disagree as rational friends. We would no more want everyone to be of the same opinion than we would want every face in the world to be identical or every body type to be identical or every piece of literature or piece of art to be identical. That uh, Clearly, the creator intended there to be a wide variety of visages, of physiognomies, of artistic styles, of literary perspectives, of philosophies, of understandings of history, and he expected – Uh, When he created the world, there to be differences of opinion about public policy. And it's, in fact, the the sorting out in a harmonious way of the differences of opinions about policy that refine them. Uh, I don't think anyone, uh, not myself, not Colonel Hamilton, not John Adams, not even George Washington or Benjamin Franklin, is wise in all things. But Franklin would come forward with a proposal. It might be met in very strenuous debate. And after a long period of discussion, a better, more thoughtful, more harmonious, synthetic idea would emerge from that mix. That's the very stuff of how a democratic culture works. Hmm. Well, sir, I'm of an age where I've lived through enough different uh, administrations to to see some real contentious behavior. Maybe nothing like the time you lived in, maybe more so. Uh, But... I wish that we as Americans could remember what you have said, sir, and that is that uh, just because we disagree, we can still do so rationally and and do so with an attitude of a civil discourse. I'm sure there are those who would call me naive well, for they, making that statement. They but. would be wrong if they dismiss you in that way because I believe strongly that harmony is the essential ingredient of a republic. And in my first inaugural address, I actually attend to this idea. And I said, every difference of opinion is not a difference of principle. We have called by different names men of the same principle. We are all Republicans. We are all Federalists. We share more than we disagree about. Everyone wants the same thing, more or less. We want a government that's strong enough to hold us together and to protect us from the unlikely event of invasion from without. We want the least government that can do all of this and the most inexpensive government that can do all of this. And my party, the emerging Republican Party, wanted less government and more local government and states' rights and in, 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 in much greater frugality and, and less interest in commerce and war, and the other party, the Federalist Party, with a slightly more pessimistic view of human nature, wanted somewhat more government, somewhat more central government. Uh, They were less less opposed to war as an instrument of state. They were certainly um, um, more greatly in favor of commerce as the engine of, of prosperity and happiness. So we disagreed. But what I wanted us to realize is that we all basically wanted the same thing, which was the most happiness for the most number with the least oppressive government that would make that all work. Mr. Jefferson, getting back to your dinner parties, um, as far as I know, sir, you are the only president ever to give dinners such as these so extensively. I don't know that that's true, but John Adams once grumbled, uh, as as he tended to do, that I had, I had stopped doing levies. You know, he and George Washington had had weekly levies, and these are sort of levies. I, I'm unfamiliar. It's a with monarchical that. habit where the king uh, comes into a room, and all of the courtiers and all of the people that want to flatter oh, him are there, yes, sir. Yes, and sir. the king then slowly works his way around the circle and bows stiffly, and people say, "Oh, your honor, or your highness, what a splendid honor to meet you!" And but George Washington held them every Thursday. 
this levy, and he would appear and he wouldn't shake hands. He was very stiff. It was very formal, and he was quite aloof. And people were meant to feel the majesty of his power. And then John Adams went even further and had his own levies and and it made it somewhat ridiculous because face it, John Adams was not George Washington. When I became president, I I ended these levies and and simply had these two public receptions per year on New Year's Day and on the 4th of July. And then I had these these small private dinner parties in the White House. And Adams later said, Mr. Jefferson says he got rid of levies, but his every day was a levy. He had levies all the time. And so he regarded these dinner parties as my own version of the levy, but they were nothing They were nothing of the sort. So I used this partly because I wanted to provide hospitality to these lonely uh, congressmen who were marooned in this brand new federal capital, but also because I realized that I could build goodwill. And let me give you an example, sir. A man named William Plummer of New Hampshire was a high federalist. He was a New England Calvinist federalist. And he came to Washington during my first term. And he came predisposed to dislike me. And he did dislike me. And he thought that I was a Jacobin and a wild man and that I was unfit to hold the title of president of the United States and so on and so forth. He, he had no, no benefit of the doubt that he was willing to give me at any level. He was going to oppose everything that I was, everything that I proposed, everything that I stood for. So I invited him to dinner parties. And you can follow this if you like. He left a very good record of all this. When he first came, he said, I really dislike this Jefferson. And, and I had it was a terrible thing. And it, it, he, it, this is exactly the sort of uh, demagoguery that you expect from such a person. And he said, but you know, the, the, wines were, the wines were quite good. And then he goes away and he comes back a month or two later. And, and then the second time he says, you know, I, I still like, dislike this Jefferson a great deal. And I don't trust him, but it was a pretty good meal. And he had seven different types of wine. And those were some of the best wines that I ever drank. And then a few months go by and he, he says, another great day at Mr. Jefferson's house. And the meal was exquisite. And even though I, I can't quite reconcile myself to his politics, he has an exquisite taste. And, and he, he led the conversation in a way that really made everyone feel included. And he had a, he had a particular interest in my ideas. And then finally, as you know, if you follow the the paper trail on this, when I retired in 188, uh, voluntarily after two terms as president, William Plummer came to me and said, you shouldn't resign. You should stay on for a third term. <laughs> You're important to this country. And he actually became a moderate Jeffersonian when he became the governor of New Hampshire in 1812. I, I, I rest my case a that success. good food and good wine. I am familiar with this. And he wrote a description of when he first saw you. Well, let's, let's hear it. A tall, high-boned man entered the room wearing, quote, an old brown coat, True. red waistcoat, old corduroy small clothes, much soiled, uh, <laughs> woolen hose, and slippers without heels. He said, quote, I thought this man was a servant, but was surprised by the announcement it was the president. <laughs> I, this was deliberate, of course. I wanted to show these high federalists that the president is not a king, that, that we should not let the costume be the man, and that this is truly a proto-democratic society. And Every distinction we make in, in these ways between the average citizens, of which the great majority, of course, are, and the handful of the governing class is a mistake, and that the president should really uh, harmonize more completely with the mass of people, of which, in my view, he is one. Well, sir, during your eight years there, it said your appearance was always pretty much like that. I wonder what Mr. Adams would have thought. Well, Adams understood me. He realized that this was a form of political theater. But he also was not as caught up in finery as some of the others of the Federalists. He did want a ceremonial sword, and he did want titles of nobility for himself and other national officers. But I don't think he would have lost much sleep over whether my slippers had their heels broken or not. <laughs> a fun conversation, Mr. Jefferson, and we'll return to it in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back to the Thomas Jefferson Hour, your weekly conversation with President Thomas Jefferson. And this week, we're speaking with Mr. Jefferson about a particular talent he had, and that is uh, giving dinner parties, sir. Uh, now, I said, uh, according to what I read, uh, 
you pretty much didn't mix the opposition. In other words, if it was Federalists, it was just Federalists. If it was Republicans, it was just Republicans. If it was cabinet members, it wasn't Congress. Is that accurate or am I wrong? It, it's mostly accurate. So let me say a few things about this. First of all, I, I had round tables. I did not have uh, rectangular tables because I did not want to have a, a head of the table and a foot of the table. It was, and, it was that important, sir? Well, you know, King Arthur and the round table, that shows there's no particular distinction between one person are, and the Are you the saying next. that was an inspiration or just a common thought? A common thought. And so I had I, I had that system, and I had had between eight and twelve people. I chose the guests carefully. I tried not to create any political volatility, and so I tried to think, well, who would be a good person to pair with these others? What kind of harmonies can I bring out? It's not that they were necessarily all of the same party, but I wanted to make sure that there were not any open disputes or enmities that might cause a, a lack of, of, of good sense and conciliation. And I did a lot of the shopping for these uh, for these meals. I, I designed the menus myself. I chose the wines. I had, of course, an enormous collection of French wine. I spent about a tenth of my annual salary as president on wine for my guests. And then I would choose the menu. And I would even take my horse and ride to the various greengrocers around the District of Columbia and beyond to say, oh, the asparagus is looking good. Let's have that. And oh, look at these Brussels sprouts. And of course, we're going to have peas. And so I would carefully choose all of this. And then I often would put something on the table. So here you'd have 12 congressmen and there might be a, a jar of water from the Mississippi or there might be a, a, a new book on parrots. Or for a time, as you know, Meriwether Lewis sent back a live prairie dog and I actually was able to display it. You had conversation starters, yes, in other words. Yes, but, 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 but nonpartisan ones and ones that were likely to make people realize the wonder of America. It's hard to believe earlier you said, Mr. President, that you stayed away from politics during these dinners. How, I, I don't see how you could have. Well, I, we wouldn't have an open political discussion. No one would say, how about that bill about the tariffs or what should we do about uh, uh, creating a national university? None of that. But during the course of the meal, I might say something like, well, Mr. Madison, I know that you've been working a little bit on the question of tariffs. I, how's that coming along, sir? And then he would say, well, I mean, not to talk about it at the table, Mr. Jefferson, but, but it's, uh, I think if a few Federalists will understand. And so there was a little of that, a little political shaping. But for the most part, it was just good food, good conversation, a lot of intellectual curiosity. And then, of course, singing the song of America. I wanted people to love uh, American possibilities as, as much as I did. And so if there were a new book or a, a new discovery from the West or a mammoth bone or some archaeological dig that I had been aware of, I would try to bring that in. I often brought in savants, scientists, men of letters, philosophers, uh, people that would bring uh, could maybe do a sort of a miniature seminar or a very casual lecture at table. Or at least provide interesting conversation, right, I'm Because sure. that's the sort of, of course, conversation that I most loved. One of the most famous bargains that you struck at a dinner table was that between uh, James Madison and Alexander Hamilton. I'm sure you know the dinner I'm well, speaking of. That was of. 1790 in New York, and I was not, the, not, I was not the president at that time. I had just come back from Europe. You know, I'd been the American minister to the court of Louis XVI from 1784 to 1789. I got back in, in late November, early December 1789, and this was at Norfolk. And I went to Monticello, and my daughter Martha was married to her cousin Thomas Mann Randolph in the, in the early spring of, of, of 1790. Um, and then I came, I made my way to the new um, national capital in New York, and George Washington was president, and John Adams was vice president, and I was his secretary of state, a role that I had not asked for and, and didn't particularly want, but but accepted because it was George Washington, and, and we, every able person needed to accept the call of duty under our new Republican constitution. So I, I made my way to New York, and I had, hadn't been there very long, and, and I was walking up and down the street in front of George Washington's home. He was renting a place in lower Manhattan, and I saw Colonel Hamilton, I, and I knew him a little, and I knew of him, certainly. He was a war hero, and he had been Washington's favorite, his aide-de-camp during the war. And so 
But he looked disheveled and and upset and really kind of falling apart. And and so we strolled together up and down the street for a few turns. And I asked him, "My my dear sir, what 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 is it that that's ailing thee?" And he said, "Well." He had proposed that the United States government absorb all of the Revolutionary War debts, not only the national debt from the war, but state debts too, that this was known as the Assumption Bill, that all of the accumulated indebtedness from the successful War of Independence would be thrown into a single pot and then paid off at par. And on the first um, go around in the legislative session, he had lost. There was there was intense opposition to the assumption bill for reasons that I can go into if you want. And so he felt that if the bill failed, that 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 his dream of of rescuing the finances of our new republic would would fail, and that he would have to resign in ignominy for not being able to to fulfill the promise that he had kept that he had made to fix the finances of, of the United States. And so I have to admit I didn't really understand this very well, but I knew that he was deeply upset. And so I said, is there any way that I can be useful to you in this? And he said, well, you know, Mr. Madison speaks for Virginia, which is one of the states opposing the assumption bill. If you could convince Madison to see it my way, uh, that would really be very useful to me. And I replied, well, I don't – I have to say I don't know that much about it and I certainly would not pretend to, to tell James Madison the right thing to do. But I'll tell you what I can do. I could have a little dinner party. I have a beautiful rental place here. Uh, I could have a little dinner party and you could come and Madison would come and maybe a couple of others, but it shouldn't be large, and I'll serve a beautiful meal with great wines, and then I'll just sort of pull back, and the two of you can talk this through a little bit and see if we can come to some sort of accommodation. And Hamilton thought that would be a very good idea. So I went to Madison, my closest friend, and I said, here's what I've sort of agreed to do. What do you think? And he was pretty skeptical uh, because he thought that, as I later came to agree, that the assumption bill was a was a bad thing. But he said, Mr. Jefferson, we want the new national capital not to be New York, not to be Philadelphia, but to be in the Upper South, really be best on the Potomac River. What if – and we can't get Congress to agree to it – what if Hamilton could make it possible for – the new capital to be located on the Potomac in the Upper South, and then we might find enough votes for his assumption bill to pass, maybe that solves some problems. So I said, fine. I had the dinner party. Um, of course, the food was, was marvelous and great wines. And as usual, I sort of folded my arms across my chest and let them talk, and they worked it out. And Madison said to Hamilton, I can't in good conscience, vote for your assumption bill. But I think I can probably convince some other Virginians that they will, and that solves your problem. If you can convince the Pennsylvanians and the New Yorkers and the New Englanders to permit the national permanent capital to be located on the Potomac somewhere near Mount Vernon, uh, the home of, of course, the great George Washington. And Hamilton didn't like that idea very much. But he said, well, if that's the price of the assumption bill, I think I can probably convince some northerners and some people from the middle colonies to agree to this. And they both went away and both of them delivered and the two bills were passed. And in 1800, the capital of the United States moved to the District of Columbia, which was carved out of Virginia and Maryland, and the assumption bill passed. Uh, and the country went on. Historians today refer to this as the Great Compromise, and uh, we could learn lessons in my time, sir, from that. Well, I, I later realized that I had, in a certain sense, been duped. I didn't – I have to admit, I, I had been away for five years. I didn't really know the machinations of Colonel Hamilton. I didn't realize how um, how thirsty he was for authority and power. I didn't realize how he was really giving himself over to the moneyed classes and – what he called the wise, the rich, and the well-born. And when I, when I realized what he had done later, that I had, in effect, 
allowed myself to be used, uh, it really deepened my resentment of Hamilton. But the fact is, um, I did it. I, I, I held the dinner party. I stayed aloof from the conversation. But I made it clear to Mr. Madison that I thought that this sort of um, spirit of compromise was probably essential in a republic like ours. And the Assumption Bill passed, but so did the, the sighting of the Capitol in the District of Columbia. While you were in the White House and you had these famous dinners, sir, it, I should say it, um, my understanding is is that uh, it was calculated that you spent about $50 a day during your time. That was a great deal of money um, to, to host these dinners. Uh, is, that, is that accurate to say, sir? I haven't done the, the exact math, but I will say this. It's really important for people in your time to know that while the president was paid a, an enormous salary, $25,000 per year, which is millions in your currency, uh, he had to provide all of his own household staff, all of his own hospitality, all of his own wine, his horses, his carriage. So it wasn't just a salary. It was a an operating budget. It, exactly, with a small stipend. And so I spent, as I said, a tenth of my, of my annual budget. Um, presidential salary on wine alone, not for my own consumption. I'm a very moderate man, but for my guests. And then the, the food cost a fortune. It's said that, that uh, your wine buying sort of settled down towards the end of your presidency. Well, because I had built up a very large cellar for one thing, but also, you know, uh, as I, so when I first became president, $25,000 per year seemed like a fortune. It was going to solve all my problems. I was going to pay off my debts and rebuild Monticello and take care of all sorts of things. Well, by the time I left in in March of 89, I realized that A, I had spent every bit of it, some of it on Monticello. And, that, and I hate to admit this, but I had spent so much of that $25,000 per annum, eight times 25 is $200,000, that I actually had to borrow money to leave Washington City to retire back to Monticello. I, I, I couldn't leave the city without borrowing a small amount of cash, even though I had earned millions and millions in your currency yeah, during you, those You're certainly years. not asking for our sympathy, are you, sir? A loan is what I need. It's a, it's a rather small loan. Very good. Uh, these dinners must have occupied a great deal of your time of, your, of each day. Well, one must eat. Uh, do, but but your, your dinners, were, is said, start mid-afternoon, 3 or 4 o'clock, and last well into the evening. They could under certain circumstances, but more often they were an hour and a half or maybe just slightly more than two hours in duration, and, and earlier in the winter and later in the summer because of the longer day. Well, plus there was an extensive menu, maybe not all the dinners, but there's a Reverend Cutler who uh, describes the menu. The main course consisted of rice soup, round of beef, turkey, mutton, ham, loin, of veal, cutlet of mutton or veal, fried eggs, fried beef, and a pie called macaroni. Yes, I brought back a macaroni machine. Now, macaroni in my time meant more than macaroni. It was really all pasta. My, I, my point, sir, is, is that this was quite uh, – that's a huge dinner. Couldn't you just feed them a few sandwiches and be good with it? Uh, certainly not. I spent some time in northern Italy. I brought back a macaroni machine, and, and I was one of the first uh, Americans to, to serve pasta. And, it, and, I, and I did create a macaroni and cheese recipe, so I suppose I have that uh, to my credit. It's not on my tombstone at Monticello, but it probably has had a greater social impact in the course of American history. Virginia hospitality is famous for its profusion, and you don't know if someone's going to like mutton or they prefer beef or they prefer oxtail, and so these meals were, were very full. No, why not have them all? There is one dinner that uh, we must discuss, and because of your, um, well, the, your appearance, your attitude of a round table and no hierarchy, there were English ambassadors that, well, they were none too keen on this new American tradition of dinners with you, sir. And there's one ambassador in particular. I wonder if you might share the story of uh, Mr. Mary. Anthony Mary, the, His Majesty's diplomat to Washington. Well, there are a couple of problems here. One is that he would have preferred a Federalist. You know, he would have preferred being the the British ambassador to the Washington administration or to the Adams administration or, for that matter, even to the Madison administration, he wound up with the least friendly president he could possibly have in me. And, of course, he would have preferred that, that he be posted to Philadelphia or New York or Boston and not to this new, uh, very limited federal 
enclave in the District of Columbia. So he turns up and he and, and he had met with Madison. He came to present his credentials. And the, there wasn't even really a set of steps at the White House yet. The whole thing was still uh, being finished, and the landscaping was unbegun, and it was. It was. I have to admit, it was. It was. It was pretty raw. So he turns up in full British diplomatic regalia with a wig and you know, staff and uh, epaulets. And as far as he would know, that would be the correct and proper thing to do. Of course, and and he of course is still resenting American independence. So he turns up, and I kept him waiting. Uh, in the White House for a fair amount of time before I came to see him. And he expected, of course, everyone to drop everything the minute he appeared. And when I finally appeared, it's a description not unlike William Plummer's. He said that the president was wearing a coat that was too small for his long arms and legs and that I my linen was none too clean, I think was his term, and that my stockings were, had, were down around my ankles and that my slippers were down at heel. And I think he even said, this is in an official report to the cabinet back in London, I think he said that there was even a bit of egg, a little egg stain on my jacket. Oh, Mr. Jefferson, you can you can tell me the truth. You you did this on purpose, did you not? Well, not the egg, <laughs> but the rest. But the rest, yes. But I, it's not that I did it on purpose, but but. Well, but it was a political move. It must have been calculated. I wanted the American people to realize that I was their first citizen, perhaps temporarily. And it was okay if you had a bit of egg on you. Well, I didn't expect the egg, but, you know, the egg didn't hurt. But (laughs) so this gets worse. So he comes and he's very offended because I kept him waiting and because I wasn't properly addressed uh, addressed and so on. Well, then I think it's three days later that Anthony and Mrs. Mary came to a White House dinner of the kind we've been talking about. And... They believed that they were the senior diplomatic couple in the city, which which would have been true anywhere else in the world. And since I was a widower, when it was time for dinner, she assumed that the right protocol was that I would take her arm and say, Madam, may I carry you into table? And so the dinner gong sounded or was announced, and I didn't take her arm. I went with a, the wife of a, of a congressman, and she then had to sort of scramble to find a dinner date. And when they got into the dining room, there were no seating charts. There were no um, placards at the tables. And she discovered that that you just sort of had to find a place to sit. And her poor husband was even farther away from my chair. Anyway, they, they were completely 100% miserable and sat just stiff as and angry as possible through the meal. And afterwards, they came up and they stood in front of me and they were livid in rage and humiliation. And she finally said, Mr. President, I demand to know what is the protocol of, of this White House. And I said, why, madam, it is pell-mell. And I was never really forgiven for this. I actually wrote, it became an international incident, and I wrote a memo to, to James Madison, the Secretary of State, saying, how should we handle this sort of thing in the future? And I said... If Mrs. Mary insists on playing the virago, she must learn to sip her soup at home. A delightful conversation this week, Mr. Jefferson, and I so thank you for it, sir. Why, sir, it is it is pell-mell. <laughs> We're going to take a short break. We'll be back in just a moment. You're listening to The Thomas Jefferson Hour. Welcome back, everyone, to the Thomas Jefferson Hour. I'm Clay Jenkinson. I have taken off my wig and tights. Uh, I am dressed, however, and I am sitting across from the semi-permanent guest host of the Thomas Jefferson Hour, Mr. David Swenson. Sir, we are talking about Jefferson, one of my favorite subjects, Jefferson's dinner party. Hell no. You, you, there is a quote, I'm certain you can uh, recall it, um, that we, 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 we must include in this program, and that's John F. Kennedy and oh, hosting certainly. a dinner party. Could you tell that story? Oh, my. It's one of my favorite stories because I've seen the documents. John Kennedy, when he was president, was hosting, I think, 35 Nobel Prize laureates in the White House. And the speech had been written for him, as speeches are. But JFK, who was a, a serious reader of history, had penciled into the margin the following. He said, this is probably the greatest gathering of talent and intellect in the history of this White House, except... Possibly when Thomas Jefferson dined alone. 
That's great. Well, Jefferson never dined alone, but you get the point. It's yeah. a great thing to have said. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, it it's is. so perfect for JFK to have said that. I thought that. that was sort of a good lead into this. It really is fascinating. Again, you, you asked to talk about his, his dinner parties and no argument for me. It's always fun to go back and look at these things. And I just want to be at the, at the dinner party with Anthony and Mrs. Mary. <laughs> um, I get, you could just imagine. Uh, Jefferson did a pretty good imitation of Mrs. Mary. I hadn't heard that before. You think well, you you brought it up? Could you have that William Plummer quotation handy? Yeah, I can find it. Which one? Are you Where he about? talks about the, the the slippers and the. Oh yes. Can you read it again? Certainly. That's uh, actually that comes from WhiteHouseHistory.org. Reads, one morning in early December 1802, a Federalist senator just arrived from New Hampshire was ushered into the president's house with some fellow legislators. After a few moments, a, quote, tall, high-boned man entered the room wearing an old brown coat, red waistcoat, old corduroy small clothes, much soiled, woolen hose, and slippers without heels. <laughs> William Plummer later wrote a friend, I thought this man was a servant, but was surprised by the announcement it was the president. Oh, that's so good. It is, yeah. And you know that this had to be political theater. Jefferson dressed better at Monticello than he did as the president of the United States. Kind of says something about his character, though. I mean, that he would do this just to goad people, don't you think? I love it. I love it that— Well, I, mean, I don't disagree with that, but it says something about him. He, you know, I don't— you, Did you see— Where you, else do you see this in him? Oh, there's lots of this in Jefferson. So you you saw the John Adams miniseries. Yeah, it's been a long with Paul time. Paul Giamatti I, I'd like as to, Actually, it's still on. I'd like to watch you that again. You should watch it again, because yeah. in the later episodes, Jefferson looks like— Captain Kangaroo or the Cat in the Hat. He's he's wearing all these weird clothes and stripes and tall hats and he's an eccentric. He's an actual eccentric, kind of strange in some ways. We don't really hear that in uh, contemporary descriptions of him. Is that because it wasn't a a common word or because people were being respectful and didn't want to be judgmental about him? I think you know William Mackay from Western Pennsylvania saw Jefferson when Jefferson was the Secretary of State, and he comes in to give this testimony before the Senate, and he said he had kind of a scranny aspect, and he sat with one on one hip and his long legs, and he said his his conversation was kind of rambly and desultory, but he said with with nuggets of real genius. You just get this picture of Jefferson as this person. In my life, I know people that are eccentric. They have specific talents that you admire. So yes. you, you think some of that was going on with Jefferson then? I think Jefferson was just odd. And I think that he was probably on the spectrum a little bit because he, if, if you look at all, the autism spectrum, he kind of has a case of mild Asperger's. You know, he's, he doesn't make eye contact. Well, those spectrums are growing as we they are. You know, I, all the time, I hear right? you, but yeah. but and we shouldn't diagnose people who can't be put or, on the or couch. make light of it. I believe that he that that there is this quality to Jefferson that he's uh, he's he's not good with people at first glance. He's a counter. You know, he's counting the number of peas that go into a quart and the number of strawberries and he's making yeah. grids and charts and he's always <laughs> counting something. He's a he's a detail guy, a data collector. He has his little ivory tablets and he's always jotting something down in pencil. This is a strange human being, Thomas Jefferson. But, but don't you don't you know somebody like that in your current life that you kind of look out for and want to protect a bit? I think we all do. Yeah. And, but I think that Jefferson was – I don't think – so I do think you're right that he was posing for Anthony Mary. But he but he did it with Plummer too. But the thing about Plummer is so great that we turned him. Like Plummer a year later is like, this is the greatest man I've ever met. Uh -huh. Well, at least his wines are great. <laughs> I love this. And, and Jefferson – I mean Jefferson was very serious about this, David. He said, we either are or we are not a self-governing nation. If we are, then we can't have an elite class of special people who govern the rest of us. We have to be democratic in some fundamental sense. And the president should not surround himself with liveried servants and carriages and, and so on. Uh, the president should be kind of a first citizen. And he said, I'm a farmer. I'm a scientist. I happen to be president. He had geraniums. He had mastodon bones. He had, of course, his pet um, bird, his mockingbird, Dick, that flew around. Jefferson behaved as if the White House were 
Monticello in Washington rather than the other way around. You know, today we have the summer White House at Camp David or Mar-a-Lago or wherever. For Jefferson, it's like, I'll just transfer all the whimsicalities of Monticello to the White House. I got to ask you, um, being the Jefferson scholar that you are, sir, uh, how much of this do you think was philosophy oriented and how much of it you think was Jefferson recognizing that in this young country, he needed to set precedence. He made fun of John Adams, you know, titles of nobility, his rotundity and the ceremonial sword and the levies and all of that. So some of it was a deliberate style, a democratic small d style that Jefferson was adopting. Some of it was that he was always a little eccentric and shabby in his personal dress so that this is who he sort of was. And part of it is uh, deliberate attempts to make sure the country understood what's at stake here. You know, he walked to his inaugural. He he didn't do the things that his predecessors had done, which he thought were little echoes, little fumes of the monarchical, aristocratical world that we had emerged from. And he believed that unless you set these new precedents firmly and create a symbolism of democracy or republic, then you're probably going to go down the wrong path as a nation. And so I think he was very serious about this. At the same time, he must have enjoyed torturing Anthony and Mrs. Mary because that letter that he wrote to, to Madison saying if she if she insists on playing the virago, virago means our B word, if she insists on playing the virago, she must learn to sip her soup at home. That's clearly intended as humor. Back to uh, the WhiteHouse.org thing. I talk uh, one one thing. I, I kind of kick out of it. Uh, a Dickerson, Malin Dickerson, friend of Meriwether Lewis, he said uh, uh, Jefferson takes good care of his table. No man in America keeps a better. However, he may neglect his person. Uh, in other words, he could he could be a mess. Immediately after he was elected, he did send some prospective letters out to cabinet members. But one of the first things he did in the first three days, even before getting Meriwether Lewis as his private secretary was to look for a French chef. Honoré Julien became his French chef. And guess what? It was Honoré Julien who got the map from the Aricara that we've talked about on the show. This Aricara man named um, Eagle Feather, uh, Pia Hato, goes to Washington to meet the great father. While he's there, he makes this map of the Aricara world. It's been in a French archive for 200 years, it was recently rediscovered. We published it in the Lewis and Clark Journal. We proceeded on. It's in French. It's an incredibly important map that's been neglected for all this time, lost really. And But on it, there's a little there's a little documentation of its provenance, and it, and it was dedicated to Honoré Julien, huh. Jefferson's French chef. That's great. How, that, that's called the cartouche, but that's a weird thing that it, it's not given to Jefferson. It's given to the French chef of Jefferson. They'd like to know the backstory. And That'd all be of an that. interesting story. Uh, it's just about time for your essay this week, sir. But you know, as usual, uh, uh, you called the, the the subject this week, and I tried to do some prep work and yes, a, little, sir. a little bit of. And I ran across one description of Jefferson's dinner parties that okay, I thought good. really stood out. And I'm going to read it to you, and and I'll let you comment. Everyone came away from these meals warmed by fine wine, but not intoxicated, delighted by fine cuisine, but not sated, pleased that they had had the attention called to them by the President of the United States, pleased that there had not been some sort of stuffy diplomatic talk or political wrangling of any sort. That's you, great. Do you recognize that? No. Well, you wrote that. Oh, wow. Where's that from? <laughs> well, uh, it's, uh, who, the internet? <laughs> that, that, you know, and I was going to say before we run out of time that John Quincy Adams also oh, he's went a to good many one too, yeah. And he writes pretty snarky stuff. He does. And Jefferson like, said that it was so cold in Paris one year when he was there that the Seine froze and people were skating on it. Yeah. And Adams was like, no. That's not true. He, that's a whopper. <laughs> Tall stories. And right? Jefferson said to, at one of these dinner parties, he told John Quincy Adams that he had learned Spanish in 19 days by reading Don Quixote while traveling on the Atlantic. And uh, John Quincy Adams says, no, that Jefferson tells tall stories. So he, he saw right through Jefferson and could never forget him. But he said, great food, great wine. Well, I thought your quote was really good and a good place to end. Sure. Wow, who knew? Uh, that's I like that. A good place to end and uh, because it is now time, sir, for this week's Jefferson Watch. 
I'm trying to imagine a dinner party hosted by Thomas Jefferson. Perfect food, cooked in the avant-garde French fashion, and a flight of fine wines. And Jefferson presiding, a man of perfect manners, who seems to have no discernible ego. He does not hold forth about anything. There's nothing boisterous about him. He never calls attention to himself. In fact, he seems too meek to be the president of the United States. Like some modern Socrates, he spends the afternoon, these dinners were by daylight in the age of Jefferson, drawing everyone else out, asking questions, thoughtful questions, making sure everyone at the party gets to shine a little in the course of the evening. Afterwards, everyone who attended goes away thinking he or she had been Jefferson's favorite guest. And what wines? I've spent my life around alpha males, we specialize in one type in my native North Dakota, the big man who knows more about how things should be done than government, who tells hunting stories well, who drinks a beer and then collapses the can in front of you like a human trash compactor, who actually swaggers in his supreme self-confidence and looks upon any evocation of nuance or subtlety as, well, just a bunch of hogwash. Then there is the more national variety of the alpha male, knows how to get things done, knows what money can buy, takes all the time he wants in putting his luggage in the overhead bin, orders a double maker's mark, he's particular about his grain alcohol, and opens the Wall Street Journal as if he commissioned the whole thing for his private edification, laughs louder than necessary at stories that express his arrogance by seeming to be self-depreciating. You know the types. I perform with several historical characters, among them Meriwether Lewis, Theodore Roosevelt, John Steinbeck, J. Robert Oppenheimer, and, of course, the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson. They were all masters of their world, men of great mind and extraordinary achievement. You could rank them according to their ego projection, with Roosevelt at the very top, always over the top, then Oppenheimer, then Lewis, then Steinbeck, and finally Jefferson. Oppenheimer always had to be the smartest man in every room, and usually was, but his arrogance was made acceptable by his gigantic desire to know, to see into the heart of the cosmos, and his sense that whatever was at the center of quanta must be supremely elegant. Steinbeck didn't need to assert himself much. He was actually quite a quiet man. He just wanted to keep at his art, and he did not want you to get in the way of his art. It was pretty much that simple for the author of The Grapes of Wrath. Meriwether Lewis was a driven man, tightly wound, self-punishing, impatient, mission-driven. But take off his army epaulettes, and he was so meek that he could not even successfully court a woman, and he covered his insecurities with alcohol. And then there is Thomas Jefferson, a kind of Zen leader, not fond of power, not fond of alcohol, not fond of talking, not fond of celebrity, not fond of money. He sought to be a kind of invisible master, and he didn't mind who got the credit, certainly he did not want it for himself, so long as the enlightened thing got done in the end. He bent over backwards in every situation to play down rather than play up his mighty talents, and he never thought of himself as the indispensable man in any situation, soft-spoken, exquisitely polite, modest, generous, hospitable, thoughtful, sensitive to the needs of others. Before he opened his mouth or dipped his pen into ink, he asked himself, what is the most affirming thing I can say or write that shows genuine respect for the recipient without doing disservice to my sense of the truth and my vision of this country? Jefferson wrote Freedom's single most important document, the Declaration of Independence, without calling attention to himself or taking credit. He wrote one of the most important documents in the history of freedom of conscience, the Virginia Statute for Religious Liberty, and issued no news release when it passed into law in Virginia in 1786. He created one of the greatest universities in the world in his retirement and called it the University of Virginia, not Vanderbilt, Rockefeller, Brown, Yale, or Stanford. He made the Louisiana Purchase in 1803, and rather than announce his greatness from a tower— fretted about whether it was a strictly constitutional transaction or not. Theodore Roosevelt was as intelligent as Jefferson, maybe more so, and he was better read than Jefferson. 
T.R. read a book every day of his life, and he had a steel trap memory, as well as many steel traps. But he was a colossal egotist and something of a blowhard. One White House guest said, You go to the White House, you shake hands with Roosevelt and hear him talk, and then you go home and wring his personality out of your clothes. No one ever said that of Thomas Jefferson. Just the opposite, in fact. Guests reported that Jefferson was a little inaccessible at first, even cold. But after a short time, he warmed up and made you feel like a million dollars. And he poured you the very best wines you ever drank. There are many types of great leaders. There's nothing wrong with outsized personalities, unless you are the Roman farmer Cincinnatus or the Athenian philosopher Solon. You have to have some fire in the belly to become the leader of anything. But here's the difference. If you were invited to Theodore Roosevelt's White House, you would get solid food and a presidential personality the size of Mount Rushmore. If you were invited to Jefferson's White House, you would get the best meal you ever ate and seven wines, too. And you would remark in the taxi that Mr. Jefferson only spoke a dozen scattered sentences during the entire day, but drew everyone into the conversation and seemed to think you were the most interesting person there. Put it another way, you would go away wishing Jefferson had spoken more and Theodore Roosevelt less. At Jefferson's table, you would be an honored guest. At Roosevelt's, you would be given the honor of dining with Theodore Roosevelt. I'll take Jefferson every single time. I'm Clay Jenkinson. We'll see you next week for another exciting edition of the Thomas Jefferson Hour. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is brought to you each week by Dakota Sky Education. The program is distributed nationally by Prairie Public Radio. President Thomas Jefferson lived from 1743 to 1826, and this program presents his views. President Jefferson is portrayed by the award-winning humanities scholar and author, Clay S. Jenkinson. To obtain a copy of this or any past show for a $12 donation, please call 888-828-2853. Again, that number is 888-828-2853. This program is also available online at jeffersonhour.org and on iTunes. If you'd like to correspond with President Jefferson or submit a question for him to answer on the program, please visit the website at jeffersonhour.org. The Thomas Jefferson Hour is produced at McCoche Recording Studios in Bismarck, North Dakota. Music by Stephen Swinford. Thank you for listening. Please tune in again next week for another thought-provoking, historically accurate program through the eyes of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson.